Yeah, we are live. Welcome back, guys. Good morning. Yeah, I'm Anaita Marrano from the University of Massachusetts, Boston. And I'm Claire Gahagan from Agriculture and Agri-Tech Canada. Um, we are Finom Force. Actually, there is also Philippe, which is not here for these two last workshops because he just moved to a new state for starting a new postdoc uh, at the University of North Dakota, but he will be back for here next week. So for now, me and Claire, we are leading another wonderful workshop uh, of Phenom Force. And so, but before starting, as you guys know, we start with a brief introduction of what we are and, we, and what we do. Right, Claire? Yeah. So we are Phenom Force and we're working on connecting people and empowering early career researchers, building an, a library of online resources in phenomics and providing free training. So, uh, and Irita already introduced us, but you can find us on different social media and our website um, or on Twitter. And if you're watching this video, you found our YouTube channel, you should subscribe because we'll be posting more workshops until June 4th this year. And past videos are also available at the YouTube channel. And if you want to get into contact with us, this is our email. We also have a Slack page. So if you want to be added to the Slack page, you can send us an email and we'll add you. And we have different channels there about different subjects, but also for sharing job opportunities. If you have a job opportunity at your institution you want to share, if you have any suggestions for us and feedback, you can also get that either by email or to our Slack channel. And then we also have information about the upcoming workshop. On our YouTube channel, we have all of the workshops from last year's session. There was another session of workshops and this year's are also being put up there. So feel free to look back upon all the other workshops we've had, especially if you are interested in the content of today's workshop. The first workshop from this year is kind of a basics to build on to get to the point we're at for this workshop today. So it's a good one to look back on if you're interested in the subject matter. And the workshop series are all around two hours and we're working with different open source tools in phenomics every friday at 10 a.m we started on april 9th this year and we're on our fourth workshop we're hoping to build a broad network of experts and beginners uh, where you can share your knowledge and connect with other people in the community and if you're interested in the workshop make sure you register the link for the registration is in the captions there and then for today uh, if you are registered you got the link to the GitHub page with the code that they'll be going over today, but also to follow along, make sure you open up the Google Drive um, where there's a document that lists the links that the speakers will be going through today. And that's in the caption, but I'll put it again in the chat for people who are watching it live today. And yeah, so, yeah, thanks, uh, Claire, for this wonderful uh, person, introduction. Uh, so, and speaking of the, the these workshops here, as Claire said, it's about low-cost phenotyping setups. Um, and so most of the workshop there that we are doing are on these small computers, especially Raspberry Pis. And so today we have Malia Gain and, and Jose Tovar from the then for uh, Donald Day for Plant Science Center, talking about their uh, setups for time series images, I guess, or well, for their setups based on Raspberry Pi. Um, we want to also to say that, so if you have any question for the speakers, you are free to post them on the YouTube and we will then interrupt and ask the speaker to answer your questions uh, whenever possible. And so talking about the speakers, I will, we, we, we can put them on the screen and let start let them start with a workshop. Um, and so welcome, Jose and Malia, and thanks for accepting to be here today with us. Uh, it's a very great pleasure. As I say before to them, I know them because I read their papers. And so I'm so excited about this workshop today. Um, and so if you want, you can start um, sharing your screen um, and then we will leave you uh, link this workshop and we will be just in the background. Sounds okay. good. I think I've shared my screen. I think it just needs to be put up. 
So um, just a short introduction. Um, I'm Malia Guillen. I'm an assistant member and principal investigator at the Danforth Center. And um, Jose Tovar is a USDA postdoctoral fellow in my lab, very talented um, uh, postdoctoral fellow. Um, a lot of the work we do, especially in the phenotyping space, is um, supported by the agencies I've listed below. Um, and we really want to thank um, Phenome Force um, and, AP and NAPBN for um, putting on this workshop, um, especially Claire and Anarita for um, hosting today. So um, like Anarita said, we'll be talking about uh, plant phenotyping with low cost Raspberry Pi computers and cameras. Um, and there was a workshop a couple of weeks ago by Noah um, and Jeff Berry that went over a lot of the um, basics and introductions um, of working with Raspberry Pi computers and cameras. Um, and so we wanted to do sort of what we felt were sort of the next steps. So what if you were gonna wanna actually set up Raspberry Pi and computers and cameras to do higher throughput um, uh, phenotyping? So the goals for this session are a very brief introduction uh, to Raspberry Pi computers. And so if you want more details, I would highly recommend uh, looking at that PhenoForce workshop by Noah and Jeff. And then we're gonna go over, and the main thing that we're gonna go over today is setting up uh, a group of Raspberry Pis. Um, so this uh, uh, is, includes both the setup for both hardware, which um, Jose will go over, um, and then management of those Raspberry Pi computers, uh, specifically for plant, plant phenotyping. And um, our main focus, at least for this uh, workshop, is setting up Raspberry Pi computers in growth chambers. So not in greenhouses, which sort of have their own challenges, uh, but, but in growth chambers where we mainly use them. And then I'll briefly, we'll briefly have a few slides specifically about how we then go on to analyze a lot of the Raspberry Pi image data we collect um, with Plant CV, but there is a workshop, another Phenome Force workshop that um, we did uh, with Haley and Noah um, that has a lot more details, which will go into the actual analysis of, of Raspberry Pi images. And that was also a Phenome Force workshop, I think during the last session, which is still, still available on YouTube. So just very briefly, um, at the Danforth Center, we have um, several high throughput phenotyping systems. Um, the first system we had um, officially was a commercial system, uh, Lemnitex Scanalyzer 3D, that was um, has an attached growth chamber, and then an imaging loop that can that can house 1140 plants. Or sorry. The like growth chamber can house 1140 plants and those plants can be imaged approximately daily. Um, and there's an RGB imaging station as well as a near infrared imaging station. So two imaging types, RGB and near infrared. Um, my lab, when it started, we uh, set up a hyperspectral imaging system um, and so that we could collect an additional imaging modality. But another thing that we were really focused on was um, how can we collect data that was like um, what we were getting from this very expensive commercial system, but at much lower costs? Because even as members of the Danforth Center, it still costs quite a bit of money to run experiments on systems like this. And since we only have one, that means that we can only have one environment at a time. And so we wanted a way to collect image data um, but at lower cost and in multiple environments. And so that's why we became interested, um, a lot very interested in, in figuring out ways to set up these Raspberry Pi computers um, in growth chambers so we could collect uh, high throughput and high resolution um, time course image data. So we use Raspberry Pi computers in a number of different ways. Um, so in addition to growth chambers and setting up high throughput systems, we also simply use them as computers to control things like SLR cameras and to collect image data. We also have smaller imaging boxes where we have several Raspberry Pi computers and cameras. So this is a Raspberry Pi computer. If you're not familiar with how big they are, they're about the size of a credit card. Um, and then the cameras are um, about eight megapixel cameras that are fixed focus. 
um, that we can set up in a number of different sort of configurations. So we like them because they're flexible and they're cheap. So if we break them, um, it's not like breaking an SLR camera where it's a, you know, a high expense to the lab. So in this case, in this sort of octagon imaging setup, you know, we had three or four cameras set up um, at different angles so that we could capture a plant sitting in the middle here um, at different angles and then co basically collect data that was sort of similar um, to what we were getting off of the um, phenotechnic system. So a plant at multiple angles, a single plant at multiple angles. What we uh, do a lot of, like I mentioned before, is putting, is putting these Raspberry Pi computers um, into growth chambers. And so we wanted today to go over a lot of the sort of nitty gritty details on how we set this up, the logistics in terms of setting this up, um, because it's a bit more complicated than just sort of throwing, um, to, you know, taping these cameras to, to the chambers. Um, so we have approximately six growth chambers now set up with Raspberry Pi computers and cameras. Um, and so we have um, a, a good amount of experience and made a good amount of mistakes um, throughout um, setting these things up. Um, uh, I will not claim that anything we do is say perfect, perfect, um, but what it's, it's, it's good, sort of good enough for what we need it for. So um, just to point out some key features of what you're seeing in these images, um, there are Raspberry Pi computers set up um, above these plants that are growing. Um, so you can see these flats of plants. You'll notice that um, in each of these flats, there's screens and Jose will kind of go over why that is. Um, and so with, with the growth chamber, these two growth chambers we had up, uh, set up at one time, um, we could image approximately 2,500 pots simultaneously. So more uh, plants technically than the, our fancy phenotyping system could image and um, uh, at higher time resolution because we weren't um, imaging those plants individually, we're doing those all at the same time. And um, we also, um, so in that way, if you're interested in something like growth rate over time, um, you know, this gives us a lot higher time resolution. So I am going to now switch over to uh, giving the control over to Jose and he's gonna go over some of the, um, a lot of the detail surrounding setting up the hardware uh, for these growth chamber systems. So I'll stop sharing. All right, thank you, Malia. Uh, so I'll start from here. Uh, so again, I'm gonna go over the hardware setup basically. basically um, like Malia said, this is assuming you're gonna work in growth chambers and you're gonna use more than one Raspberry Pi for imaging. So, uh, the way you set up your hardware is tightly related to the type of images you're gonna get and how you're gonna analyze them. So there's, here's a few things to keep in mind when you're doing hardware positioning. First of all, every camera that you position will may or may not have a slightly different point of view, depending on where in the low chamber it is and how it looks at, at a flat. So if the cameras have different positions, then you're gonna have to run a different workflow to analyze those images because the plants are gonna be in different positions in the same image, in the image. Also, this is very important. They are, your internet connectivity is very important. We strongly suggest to use ethernet cables. Do not rely on Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi just drops off at any time. And then if, if you don't have internet connectivity, the device will rely on a clock that is very impre imprecise. So if, you're, if you lose internet connectivity, when it comes back, the, the clocks will realign, but as long as you don't have internet connectivity, there will be a time drift 
and that drift will be different for each pie. So your pictures may end up getting taken at different times. Also, it's very important to have uh, reliable e Ethernet connectivity to upload your images to a server. Uh, lighting is also very important. We we will show everything in growth chambers, but even within a growth chamber, you will have variations in lighting. This can affect things like white balancing and thresholding of your images later on. And then we also use size markers and color standards such as this color card. Uh, so you can white balance or correct the colors from your image later on. And, and last but not least, uh, you may or may not have to use a soy mat. We usually use some that just uh, you can find in your hardware store that are usually for lining shelves. And I'll show a picture at the end, but the, the main uh, criteria for choosing whether or not you have to use this is the type of soil you're using and if you're getting gonna get fungal or algae growing in your soil, which is common over time. So depending on how long you're gonna run your experiment and what, what type of soil you're using. So having said that, the first thing I'm gonna show you is how to clone a Raspberry Pi. Again, this is building up from the workshop that Noah and Jeff have uh, already given. So they showed you how to start the Raspberry Pi. So from the, where they left off, that, it, that assumes you, on, you, you start one Raspberry Pi, but if you're gonna need more to put in different places in your growth chamber, that's where we take over. So you're gonna need to clone your Raspberry Pi. And there's detailed instructions in our paper. So I'll switch over to that. If you go to our paper, and the link is in that Google Docs that's in the description of this YouTube video. Uh, you will see that uh, if you go to Appendix 1 specifically, you will see the instructions for initializing a Raspberry Pi 2. But if you scroll down to cloning the Raspberry Pi, that's where you will see the protocol that I'm, I'm going to show. Actually, I'm just going to show this for a Mac because that's what I have on hand right now. But this will be slightly different depending on the operating system that you have. So if you have a Windows, you will have to use a different software. But the instructions are here. If you have a Mac, then that's what I'm gonna use. And even if you have a Linux computer, then you can follow the instructions here to clone your Raspberry Pi. So if you can put my, <laughs> my yeah, thanks. <laughs> so, when you have your Raspberry Pi up and running, just like Jeff and Noah showed you in the other workshop, then you're gonna have your SD card inserted and working and you have already tested that. So once you have that SD card, this is what you're gonna clone. So you're gonna put this into your computer. And actually let me switch to Apple Pie Baker. You're gonna to need to download Apple Pie Baker if you're using a Mac. Apple Pie Baker, uh, if you wanna download, you have to really scroll all the way down until you see this. Uh, it's like all the way down here <laughs> to download. So you can download, install that, and then you insert this, and then you go to your Apple Pie Baker. And then you can go to select a disk. And then that's the disk I just inserted. If you have more than one, you'll see a list here that you have to pick and choose. Uh, we use this 16 gigabytes uh, micro SD cards. So I, you select that. And then once you have that selected, it's down here. If you made a mistake, you can unselect it using this X and then you can choose again. And then the first thing you, you wanna do is backup. So you, once you have something selected, you can either backup or restore. The first thing you wanna do is backup your one working Raspberry Pi that you already initialized. So if you go here, 
then you'll get this menu up where you can give it a title like my Raspberry Pi or whatever you want. Then you select where you want to save it and what type of format you want to use. I usually use image. Any format will work really. Then you just click save and you will see this screen and it will just usually takes a few minutes only to do this. So it's once you have it cloned, then the, the idea is that you can clone this into as many Raspberry Pis as you're going to put in your chambers. So that's one of the things you need to know is how many Raspberry Pis you're going to need. One of the things I did uh, at the very beginning of the project was, was, was see that. So if you take a Raspberry Pi into your growth chamber and put it in your growth chamber, you'll have to actually see how many plants you can look at, what's your field of view, and then depending on that, how you can arrange your plants in your growth chamber and how many pies you will need per shelf or per growth chamber. So while that is running, let me show you what's the hardware setup that you're gonna have outside of your chamber. So this is a setup that fits Ethernet and power to two growth chambers. So you see cables going one, one growth chamber and also cables going to the other growth chamber. So let me maximize this again. Mm -hmm. So uh, the way we, we drive the Ethernet cables into the growth chamber was through these holes that Conviron chambers have. So they usually come with a cap. If you just unscrew it, you can drive cables inside. And then outside you will also need, uh, uh, we're using a power over ethernet switch. It's a type of, of ethernet switch that also can allow you to drive power through the ethernet cords. So that's, uh, pretty handy because it saves you having to use separate power cords for each Raspberry Pi. You're gonna have to drive one ethernet cable to each Raspberry Pi that you're gonna install inside the growth chamber. And then you also need a, a backup battery. Uh, some people call this UPS. Uh, it's just so that when power goes out in your center or university, then uh, the, the whole system doesn't drop drop off. There's usually a little bit of, of a delay between power goes out, if there's a blackout, and then your backup generator system comes on. So this helps you keep your system up and running during that time. Looks like Baker is done. So once you have your 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 backup done in your 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 image copy to your computer, then you would put in a new SD card into your computer, and then you would do restore. So you select the image that you created. Here it is. Then you open it and it will upload it on its own. So again, once it's, once it's done, it will tell us, it will be a, a few minutes, so I'll keep moving with the presentation, but it, it will tell us, and then you can take it out and then move to the next one and to the next one. Uh, if you have many Raspberry Pis, you can see it takes, like it's it says like 20 minutes per, per SD card, so it's, it's slow, so one way to speed it up, honestly, it's I asked my lab mates <laughs> to each one run one of these in their computers. It runs on the background, so it's not much of a hassle to do it. Let me go back to my presentation now. So 
but uh, because you're gonna have to do a lot of uh, like putting hardware <laughs> inside and outside growth chambers, you really wanna be working with the people in charge of your growth chambers. You wanna make sure you don't mess anything up because it will affect your experiments. Also, you wanna work with your IT people uh, because you wanna make sure whichever switch you choose and whichever cabling you use uh, conforms to their standards and also that they, they need to activate uh, well, at least that's the case for us. We had to activate, that they had to assign an IP address to each of the Raspberry Pis we're using. So IT had to do that. And then also to your facilities, because you may need to have extra ethernet ports installed somewhere along the walls or outlets, or just have them mount your switch to the wall. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, there is a question. Do you want me to, to give it? Yes, please. Will cloning multiple pies also cover the need to calibrate each of the cameras, or does that also be done? Uh, we, we have not calibrated camera per camera. So I would say that depends on your particular situation. If you have, if you do have the need to calibrate, to calibrate each and every camera independently because they are giving you inconsistent results because of inconsistent lighting. You will have to do that separately in each Raspberry Pi. Mm -hmm. I would start by cloning one and then test them and then see if you have the need to go back to a particular Pi and just, and just uh, recalibrate it. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so the, the initial setup assumes you haven't actually done calibration. You, if you have to do it, you have to do it by pi per pi. Okay, so, and you, like I said, you also wanna work with facilities because uh, you wanna make sure everything is according to your safety standards of your institution. Uh, so let me go in a little bit more detail through what you're seeing here. So first the ethernet cables, what we're using are your regular ethernet cables, which are called technically they're defined as CAT 5E. That's the most common, uh, I think they're probably the cheapest out there type of ethernet cable. Uh, those work with power over ethernet. I don't know if you, if you can find something that's even, that would be the minimum requirement. Again, if your IT or facilities have higher standards, you will have to go up. The next uh, step up would be 6A, but then those will be much more expensive. 5A works fine for us. You also wanna measure the length of each cable. So each camera is gonna be in a different position within the chamber. So you may need different lengths to get from your port within the switch to each Raspberry Pi. Uh, you can either buy these cables in, in like a big roll of cable that you cut yourself, or you can buy them pre-cut. So either way, you wanna know the length that you're gonna cut them to. You wanna be extra because you may have to, uh, if something happens, and I'll show in, a, in a, one of the following slides, one of the things that can happen, but you may have to cut them back, back down and just for maintenance from time to time. So you may end up shortening your cable over time. That's, that's why this hang down like over here. And then you also wanna make sure they're not like laying on the floor because there's gonna be water usually every day on the floor. Then for the PoE switch, uh, PoE again stands for power over ethernet. So you cannot just use any switch whatsoever you do have to use a PoE switch if you're gonna use power over ethernet. This is an example model of one we're using. 
uh, again, I would recommend that you work with IT to make sure that wh whichever model you use can supply sufficient power to all of the pies that you are running in your node chamber. It sort of depends on how many pies. It does depend on how many pies you're going to be running at the same time, how much power you're going to need to draw from your power from your PoE switch. And then this PoE switch will also be need to be need to be plugged into a to an Ethernet port. So if that doesn't exist, again, talk to your facilities to see what's the best best way to to use that. And then IT may or may not have to enable that Ethernet port for you. And for the battery backup. This is an example of uh, one one of the one one we're using this APC back back UPS Pro 1500. Again, you want to make sure <clears throat> check with your facilities and IT department to make sure that this has enough power to sustain all the power that's being drained from the PoE switch. And uh, we also raise them, like you can see here. We raise them from the ground so that they don't get in contact with the water. This is a different row chamber. It's also raised because the floor will get wet when people water your plants every day. So what does it look like once you go inside the row chamber? So first of all, we drove the cables through these holes. So the first thing you're going to have to do is uh, is uh, cover the holes again because otherwise your air is going to be flowing outside and then your your growth chamber conditions are not going to be as stable as they should. So we just use something called a duct seal compound, which is something you can use you can find your hardware store. Uh, let me show you. If you just Google that. That seal compound, you'll get a lot of results, but here's an example. I put in the Google Docs an example of that you can find in Amazon. But again, you can find you can find them in your hardware store. It's just a like it's just a putty that you can with your hands mold and just stuff it in, in that hole to, to cover the hole. I just have a so, question before you keep going. Yes. Um, did you choose to use PoE mainly as a way of keeping the number of cables down, or is it more a more stable way to provide power than using the power source plug? Uh, I the first, the former, yeah. It's mainly just to keep the number of cables. It's 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 also I would I would add that it's also hard to 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 accommodate those big. Uh, outlets uh, and this big uh, Raspberry Pi plugs that, that you, they use for power inside the growth chamber. It's not just a cable, but there's also the, the actual thing that you pl plug into the outlet, which is big. And those cables are usually short, the ones that come with the Pi. Mm -hmm. So it's much more convenient to use PoE. Thank you. Uh, so, yeah, so once you cover that, uh, you will also have to make sure, actually, at the same time, you'll have to make sure that you, your cables are driven through the growth chamber in a way that they don't come in contact with water. Again, you or somebody else will be watering your plants frequently, probably more than once a day, so there's going to be water around here. You just want to try to avoid as much contact with water as possible. You see, in this growth chamber, we drove our cables up, uh, so almost right next to the lights. And this is an example of something I was talking about, the, why you have to cut your cables back every now and then. This is what happens when water gets in contact with your Ethernet cables. And it will happen, water and soil will come in contact eventually. You just want to try to minimize it, but you cannot completely avoid it. So when that happens, you will have to cut it back and put a new head. So that's why you want to have extra cable. So 
the support that I just shown, this is for a top view design that we, we are using. So again, our facilities personnel came up with this idea. There is a clamp here so that you don't have to drill any holes in your growth chamber. It just clamps onto this top part of the shelf. And then we use this metal bar that runs along the top of the shelf. And the reason why we use metal was because it's gonna be very, very close to your lights. So if you use some other material, it's gonna bend or just melt over time. And then your pipes are gonna be on a different angle uh, towards your plants and you don't want that. So depending also on the length, even if it's metal, uh, depending on the length, it may still bend if you drive just one bar. Like you see here, there's one bar over one shelf, but there's another shelf like it right next to it. So if we chose to draw one bar all across the two shelves together, then the bar would bend significantly. So that's why we chose to use smaller bars. Another thing, if you cannot use a smaller bar is you can drive another bar in the other direction to tie the middle of your long bar up so that it doesn't bend down. Uh, so in general, you, you wanna use thin bars to minimize shading. But another, one, one of the things you wanna do as soon as you start your project is make sure how many Raspberry Pis you're gonna need and where are you gonna position them exactly. So if you're gonna use the metal bars like this, you're gonna have to draw exactly the position where, where you wanna put the screws through. So what we did was we drove screws through the pies and then we used these uh, Raspberry Pi cases. And I'll show you the model in the next slide, but these Raspberry Pi cases have holes in the back here that you can drive the screw in and then mount the Pi using that. So for this type of case, you need two screws or two holes here, and then you can use that to mount the Pi. So, so you see two screws, you will have to manually uh, mark or and or drill each screw in the right position. So if you have them slightly slanted, then your Raspberry Pi is also gonna be slanted. So you, you wanna make sure this is done right for each and every Raspberry Pi that you're gonna put in your growth chamber. And also you're gonna have to manually adjust each screw so that there is a gap between the head and the metal bar so that you have enough space to drive this through. And, and you're gonna have to just manually adjust each and every screw for that. One final thing is uh, the screws have to be of, of uh, like masonry screws that are hard enough to drive through metal in this case, but they also have to be short enough so that they don't bump against the lights on top. And the head has to be a specific size. <laughs> so you're gonna have to probably go back to your hardware store or work with your facilities personnel so that you have find the head size that goes through here, through this bigger hole here, and then you can just move it to the side and then it stays in place. And it fits in the depth of this hole. So it's, that, that's not as easy as it sounds. <laughs> so you're, you're gonna, you probably have to gonna, we, we have had to recycle some of our old screws because it's not easy to find the right screws for every new project that you find or that you wanna do. So once you find the right screws, buy, buy them in bulk. <laughs> and yep, so that's for top view. And then you see here, we also supported everything with zip ties, the cables, and this black stuff here is the PoE adapters. I'll talk a little bit more in the next slide about those, but they're also supported. So everything is supported by this bar. So that there's nothing running on the shelf or the plant seat. So <clears throat> let me talk about the PoE adapters and the Raspberry Pis themselves, what we have used. 
For the Raspberry Pis, we're using this one that I've been showing because it has it has both a slot for for putting the camera. You can screw the camera into the case, and then at the back you have these holes for mounting them up there in the metal bar. So let me show you the model that we have been using and that has worked great for us. It's, uh, and again, this is in the list of, of links in the Google Docs. This is a kit that comes with everything, some stuff you won't need, like the, out, the, the outlet that I was talking about, this, this big thing. You won't use it if you're using power over ethernet, but, but it comes with, a, with these great cases that we really like and with a Raspberry Pi 3. Um, Jose, there are, yes. there are two questions. I think they are yes. related more or less um, because they are from the same person. Um, so how, how reliable are the electronics in a growing environment? Um, and the second question is how resistant are they against high humidity, water splashes, etc. So if you generally want to try to avoid uh, water splashes, but like I said, you can only do that to an extent, right? So if you want to, you want to try to put your cables and everything as far away from water as you can, but, but water will eventually splash. So we have, in our experience, we have had only a few pies the, the pies themselves uh, need to be replaced. It happens rarely, it happens, but I don't think we've ever had to replace, no, we have. We have had to replace cameras too. So everything will break down eventually, but the it's pies usually, and the cameras. Yep. I was gonna so, say, it's usually a couple a year um, yes. that we end up having to replace. So um, in the grand scheme of how often, how much maintenance it, because the cost is pretty low, because it's a few, a few a year, and we're, we've got hundreds. Yeah. yeah, And the cables, like I showed, that's, that's the most common problem that you you have. So you just have to cut them back a little bit and put a new head. That's really easy and really cheap. And we've had to do that. Yeah, I would say same, like few a year. Thank you. So, yeah, so that's, uh, that's the, the kit that we find has these awesome cases that we really like. <laughs> and I was talking about power. So uh, the power that you need also depends on the Raspberry Pi model that you're using. So this kit that I showed you already comes with a Raspberry Pi 3. So, so comes with a Raspberry Pi 3, and that Raspberry Pi 3 needs about 2.5 amperes per Pi. So you, you want to talk to your facilities personnel to make sure you got everything right, but that's the number you want to take into account when selecting which PoE switch you need and also which PoE adapter. So that also ties into the PoE adapter. And I'm going to show you an example. This, uh, there's a model here. Uh, there's different types. Some of them have longer cables. Some of them have shorter cables. So depending on what's best for you, you have different options. But let me go back to this website again. So whenever you browse for PoE adapters, you're gonna get, you're gonna get a long list of different stuff that you can buy. So you want to make sure that your PoE adapter is, is able to supply sufficient power. So this PoE adapter, I don't know if you can read it, but it says 2.4 amperes. So, so that is enough for a Raspberry Pi 3. But what, what if you don't have a Raspberry Pi 3? Then you have, you can go to this other link at raspberrypi.org that will tell you how much power you need for each model of Pi. 
that you have. So for the Raspberry Pi 3, 3 sorry, is 2.5, but if you decide to use a Raspberry Pi 4, then you're gonna need three amperes per Pi. So that's important that you wanna take that into account when you select the, your PoE adapters and your PoE switches. Uh, if you're gonna go with a Raspberry Pi 4, then there's a new uh, Raspberry Pi power over ethernet uh, head that you can use, that you can buy from, from Amazon or from Raspberry Pi itself. But these are the ones we're using, the ones that I, that I showed. For Raspberry Pi 3, they work fine. And they're cheap too, relatively. So, like, like I said, this is all supported in this uh, metal bar for, for top view. So then you only need to drive one ethernet cable, cable to each PoE adapter. And then from the PoE adapter, you get one ethernet cable that comes out to your Raspberry Pi. And then also, let me get this closer here, uh, one ethernet cable, and then one which you will hook into the power of your Raspberry Pi. So, your power is gonna go on one side here, and then your ethernet's gonna go over here. So that's why you need to decide on the length that you need for each of these cables when you mount them. And that depends on the model of PoE adapter. So then what, you, what, what happens if you wanna do side view, right? Instead of top view. So that's gonna be a little bit different. The way you're gonna mount your pies in your chamber is gonna be most combiron chambers, not all of them, but most will have these holes in the back of the chamber where the air comes out. So we actually use those holes to drill, to get screws through the holes. So again, getting the right screws is a whole process. So you have, wanna find a screw that has the head, that fits in these holes of your case, but also that can screw into the size of these pre-existing holes. And the length is not too long so because you don't wanna drill into anything that's behind this wall. So for some of these screws, uh, just to get the length right, we had to again work with our growth chamber personnel and also our facilities had to sometimes manually cut the length of each screw to make sure we weren't, we were not messing with anything behind this panel. Uh, but with, uh, with side view, you're, you're gonna put your Raspberry Pis at the back, like in this picture, and then you wanna have them at the right height, of course, but because we, we've used, because this, these holes are already set there, then you, I don't know, <laughs> it's probably not a good idea for you to be drilling extra holes. So the distance between two of these holes does not match the distance between the two holes in the case. So then we put only one screw, but then that means your Raspberry Pi, your Raspberry Pi camera is gonna be hanging from one screw. So it's gonna, it's gonna be tilting, right? You only have one fixed point. So every time you start an experiment, you, you wanna have to check everything is, is right and then you're gonna have to retape them. This is what we do, we tape them, but over time the tape just falls off or becomes softer, it just doesn't grab the pie, right? So every, at the start of each experiment, we do have to go back and retape every pie. For it. Well, sorry, not, not retake every, check every pie and then we take the ones that need, need to. <clears throat> so that's how we did it for side view, which we also use a lot. And with side view, you're gonna have, what, what we're doing is only having one row of plants that we image. <clears throat> because if you have more than one row, then the plants just overlap. And then the last thing that I'm gonna show you is uh, how to set up these uh, color cards. And 
like I showed, this is uh, actually, let me show you the link here. In the Google Doc, I also put a link to the color cards that we're using. It's uh, this one. It, it looks like this when it's new, but it's they are just cardboard color cards that are very easy to break. And this is what it looks like when it's new. This is after you have used it <laughs> for a few months. So you do need to replace this very often. Uh, the color is, is not good in, anymore, right? So they, they do wear out. And again, water is going to be splashing soil. So you, you will have to replace this every so often. But you also want to make sure that they're positioned right in the, in the image. So they have to be within the field of view of your Raspberry Pi camera. But also, they have to be either vertical or horizontal within your image. You cannot have them just like tilted. Well, it depends on the tool you're using. But if you're using our Plan CV tools for detection of your color cards, then that's that's going to be a problem. You, you want to have them horizontal or vertical in the final image. A little bit of tilt is no problem. You're going to have some tilt, but you want to try to minimize that. So you can use that for color correction. And again, these do move because people come in with hoses and they can push them with a hose. So you want to check, check on them often. And certainly at the beginning of every experiment, you want to make sure they're rightly positioned. You can, um, yes. Sorry, question. Do you, you have one of those color cards per cabinet or one per camera? How many do you use? Per camera, yes. And so if you you can if you you know if you don't if your budget is not enough to buy as many of those as many of these as cameras you have, then you can also try to use uh, white touch spots for just white balancing. This is this will not let you do color correction, but will let you do white balancing. And you can use both either the color card or the that spot for as a size marker for standardizing your areas and, thing, and your measurements. So if you're going to do that, which is very likely you want, you want to have some size standard, then you have to make sure that the distance between your cameras and these things is consistent from camera to camera, because that's going to depend on the the standard that's going to affect the size of the standard in pixels. Another thing is that this is another model of color card that comes with more colors on this side. <laughs> so if you're going to use our plant CV detection tools, you want to actually cover other color stuff that can interfere with the recognition of the color card. And it will, so we had to tape over the other squares that were back here. You're using this other model. This, this is more durable, but it has the problem. So you have to manually tape. And you will also have to manually tape other things that can interfere in your image. Like this was, this used to be a yellow cable <laughs> power cord. So yellow had to uh, nest with our thresholding. So we had to manually wrap it with black tape. So you do want to run some tests images before you start running your experiment. So it looks like right now the Apple Pie Baker has finished cloning. So I'll just show you that. That's the last step. So it will tell you process complete. OK, then you're ready for your next one. It auto ejects. So you can just take it off. And then, and then you can put your next one. Over. Sorry, I forgot to set auto eject on. I had to auto eject. You have to have this on this uh, this arrow on. So if you have this on, it will auto eject, and you can move to the next one, the next one, the next one faster. So to move to the next one, you insert it, do the same process, select the disk, and then go to restore. 
again. So I'll show you. You insert it, it detects it. So your next disk, and then you just go to, to restore again, and then you select your image again, and then just go through the same process, open. So you do that for every Raspberry Pi that you're gonna clone, that you're gonna be using in Mountain. So with that, I'll hand it back to Malia. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen. Okay, so uh, Jose went over sort of the nitty gritty of um, setting up the hardware. Um, obviously there's a variety of different growth chambers and setups. And so this is just giving you an example of some of the considerations that we went through when we were setting up our systems. Um, we've done a number of different sort of configurations. So if you have, further questions, feel free to reach out to us um, if you're actually setting one of these up. Um, I'm gonna go over um, management of these Raspberry Pis. So like Jose said, you can clone, you can clone the SD cards uh, to however many Raspberry Pis you end up setting up. Um, we end up using, you know, tens to, you know, many tens um, in single chambers. Um, and so, that requires uh, management for, we, uh, you want to more easily manage um, each of these, these Raspberry Pis. And so what we use to manage our Raspberry Pis is, a, um, is Ansible, um, which is nice, it's open source. Um, and so I'm gonna go over how the sort of the logistics of how we use Ansible uh, to manage our ras suites of Raspberry Pis or we call them brambles of Raspberry Pis. And so the goal here is really to make data collection as automated as possible. Um, like Jose showed, there's quite a bit of manual work um, put into setting up these systems. It's not, um, you can't just sort of slap them in there. Um, I mean, I guess you can, but it, it's, we wouldn't necessarily recommend that. You wanna get data out that's sort of as clean as you can get it. Um, and so whatever we can do to make data collection as automated as possible, we, we try and do. And so um, when we're managing our pies, there's uh, three main players. Um, so we have, um, Jose showed pictures of the um, ethernet switches um, and attached on one of those ethernet switches was a one Raspberry Pi. Um, we have one Raspberry Pi that we call the main Pi of, of, of a setup. Um, and this main Pi uh, controls or manages um, Pies that are within that growth chamber. So we call those, we, we refer to those as the puppet Pies. So there's the main Pi controlling the puppet Pies. Um, so the puppet Pies are the ones that have cameras attached and that would actually be used to collect um, individual images over uh, whatever plants we're growing. Um, and then in addition to the main pie and the puppet pies, we have uh, sort of the Danforth servers. Um, so the main pie, obviously this is a Raspberry Pi computer, it's $35. We're relying on it um, to collect our image data. Um, and so there's, a, you know, there's an SD card in here that Jose mentioned has about 16 gigs of storage space, which you know can be end up being quite a bit of image data, but we want these to run continuously. So nightly, we actually pull the data uh, to the Danforth servers so that we um, don't really have to worry about space um, on, these, on, on this main pie. So um, Jose mentioned this briefly, but one thing necessary for the main pie to control these puppet pies and also just for the, us to have a consistent connection to the main pie is that we work with our IT um, department to make sure that each of these pies has a static IP address. Um, and that's important because um, IP addresses can change if it's not, if it doesn't have an assigned one. And so if you wanna remotely SSH or connect to each of these individual pies, say from your own local computer, you need to know the IP address of, of each of the pies in your sort of suite. And so um, again, we work with our ID department in order to assign those static IP addresses. Um, sometimes, you know, when working with your university or your company, 
um, uh, companies in terms of getting uh, static IPs that can be challenging because they don't want to sort of open up their networks to all of these individual um, devices. So again, having good relationship with your IT, par IT department is very uh, important. Um, in addition to that, we put um, SSH keys from the main Pi into the Puppet Pies. This allows the main Pi to log into each of these Puppet Pies um, securely and automatically. And there's a really nice tutorial, which I've just listed to below on how to set up SSH keys. I won't go over this, um, but it's a very detailed tutorial that um, we cite often so that in, or, um, in order to set up these SSH keys. So this allows the main Pi again to log into the Puppet Pies automatically, which if you're pushing commands to these individual Puppet Pies is um, required. So I'm gonna kind of go over the logistics of how we uh, manage our pies with Ansible. Um, and then I'll actually show you the files that we have in GitHub, um, as well as show how we push commands and take images. So um, on the main pie, um, how it's controlling uh, these puppet pies is that there's a host, there's a file that's called host.ini. Um, is the link that Malia showed in the Google Doc. Um, um, yeah. I'm not sure if it is, but we can add it in there. Yeah, no, uh, no I can also, like if, if Jose wants, he can put in the private chat and I will post it there. Sure. Um, so the host.ini file is basically, and we'll look at this, but this is basically a list of all of the IP addresses that this main pie is controlling. So the way Ansible is working is it is going to execute um, its scripts over um, this list of IP addresses. So if you wanted to uh, push, um, so if you had a file that you wanted to copy to all of your pies, you could do that with a single command instead of having to log into each individual pie and then copy it to um, each individual. So, uh, so sending new scripts is, that, is one of those examples. Um, importantly for what we want to do, um, you can uh, say trigger the cameras um, over all of the IP addresses, um, which is, is pretty much what we're, we're doing. You can then also pull data from these puppet pies. So, so if you have um, each of these individual cameras uh, triggered, um, once each of those individual cameras takes an image, you can then pull that data to the main pie. We can also ping each of these individual puppet pies just to make sure that they're online. So we have um, our, our puppet pies as well as our main pie connected to Slack messaging so that if one of the pies is down or multiple of the pies is down, we get a Slack message to one of our Slack channels that says, this pie is down, check on it. Um, that way we don't have to be you know, monitoring our pies. Um, we, we kind of get automated monitoring uh, via Slack. So um, one thing is that you know, we can execute each of those um, individual scripts, those uh, Ansible playbooks over these group of host uh, IP addresses. Um, and we can also do those set to cron jobs. So cron allows us to schedule um, commands. Um, so I think uh, Noah and Jeff talked about doing time-lapse imaging with pies, and so they probably went over uh, cron jobs. But essentially, and we'll, we'll go over them as, as well, but essentially you can schedule um, a command to be executed um, at very various intervals. So you can set it at a specific um, minute of each hour. Um, you can say which hours of the day you want it to do, which days of the month, which month, and which days of the week. Um, so uh, we'll go over some of the cron commands that we, we use, but typically, you know, we're saying execute this Ansible playbook over this set of host names every hour um, at this minute. Um, and so we can do hourly imaging or even higher resolution imaging, um, depending on sort of what frequency or what resolution you want. So once we have images uh, taken from the pies and then pulled to the main pies, we actually pull that data uh, to the Danforth center, uh, servers nightly. And that's just so that we don't have a lot of data sitting on this 
Raspberry Pi that maybe is not as reliable um, as say our Danforth servers. So um, we do that uh, daily at night. Um, and so that we're you know, sort of pulling this data um, every evening. And we also have this sort of on a schedule so that we're not having to do it, it's automated. So, um, you know, we can go to our Danforth ser servers each day and just sort of, if, if we want to check to make sure that we have data sort of showing up. We have, um, uh, we have um, uh, messaging set up um, on the Danforth servers telling, pinging this main Pi to make sure that we have connectivity to the main Pi. Um, and if that drops out, we again, we get Slack messages to tell us that something's wrong. So I'm gonna actually uh, switch screens over to um, this GitHub site that I think is also listed on um, in the information in, in, on YouTube. Um, so this is just an example of how um, the Ansible playbooks or our main pie um, is sort of structured. So I'll go over the files that are in um, this repo um, and then I'll actually show you how we execute some commands on the command line. So I'm gonna stop sharing and switch screens. So um, just to mention, I think I, uh, Anna Rita is gonna add this link, but Ansible does have very nice uh, documentation. Um, it is some work to go through, um, and so that's why I think having this GitHub repo as an example um, is, is potentially helpful for those maybe interested in actually setting up one of these systems um, on your own. So um, there's a lot of information you can do a lot with Ansible. Um, and so uh, again, having this example, I think is helpful. So I'm gonna go over this. These are basically the files. Um, this is what is, what our, um, is sitting in our, um, in our um, main pi. Um, so again, you have this host.ini file. Make sure this is large enough. So this is basically a list of IP addresses. You can have a sort of parent. And so in this case, one main pi is connecting, is, is controlling the Raspberry Pis in three different growth chambers. So we have our growth chambers um, sort of numbered. So we have chamber 157, chamber 158, and chamber 159. Um, so each of these pies, um, IP addresses is a pie sitting in each of these growth chambers. Um, so the bramble is made up of each of those three chambers. Um, so I've taken out the password just for security, but um, that's sort of how uh, we use one Pi to sort of set up or control um, several different chambers worth of Pies. If, for example, you were only using one of these chambers, all you would have to do is comment out the IP addresses. So uh, by commenting out, I mean adding a hashtag or a pound sign in front of um, one of these individual IPs. That would take it out of, so if then if you were to, uh, execute an Ansible playbook and one of these was hashed out, it would not try and execute the command over that uh, individual IP address. So this host file is obviously very important because you need um, these IP addresses in order to uh, send the commands out to those pies. Okay, so then um, we have playbooks. And so these are really the heart and soul of what Ansible is doing to control the pies. And so um, we have different files in here. One uh, playbook we call take pictures. Um, so that uh, is what we're actually executing to take pictures. We can open this file up, just take a look. It is quite a different um, structure than say what somebody might be used to looking at for um, uh, Python coding, for example, but again, the documentation for Ansible is is quite nice, and they have a number of different examples. So this um, this uh, script is um, saying to execute this uh, uh, Python script called Camera Single, which is what is actually doing was which is what is on each individual Pi um, to snap a picture. 
And then if uh, the command to snap a picture was successful, um, it will read out as a success in the um, sort of out file. And then if everything is a success, success um, then uh, you won't get a Slack message. But if there are failures, um, then you will get a Slack message. Um, I think they might've changed how um, things are deal dealt with with Slack, but this is at least how ours is set up. Um, again, these systems and how ours are set up are not necessarily optimized and you might do this in a different way, but this is sort of what works for us right now. Um, there's another playbook called uh, that we ha have set up called pseudo plays. Um, this is kind of commands that we might send out to pies. Um, so say um, for every Raspberry Pi, we might have needed to install a program that wasn't installed um, when we cloned um, that SD card. And so one thing we might need to do is say, install specific programs to all the pies. You could SSH to each individual Pi, but obviously if you have hundreds of Pies, that would be a significant amount of work. And so Ansible, um, instead of doing that, we can install say Pi Camera, which is one of the programs we need for um, that camera script. Um, we can install it to all of the IP addresses at once by, um, by using um, sort of this command. Um, we needed to say install rsync, uh, to transfer the data from each individual pies. And so we had a command that's called install rsync. Um, obviously you don't need to necessarily install these programs each time you wanna run this thing. So up here you can see that um, we have install PyCam set to false, install, install rsync set to false. If for some reason we needed to um, uh, had added more pies to this suite of pies, we would set these to true and then it would install the Pi cameras to those uh, sort of new IP addresses that we've added. If, um, for example, you, um, so one of the files that we have in, on the host is that camera.singlepy. This is, uh, sorry, Python script. This is the Python script, again, that we use to trigger the cameras on the individual pies. Uh, we also sort of collect metadata with these pies, uh, with this script. Um, so, if you were to make changes to this file, you don't, again, don't wanna to have to copy it to each individual. So we make the changes on the main Pi, um, on the script that's on the main Pi, and then we can send it or copy it out to those every single Pi if, if a change is made. Say you wanted to change the gain of all the cameras or you wanted to change some metadata that was collected, we would just need to alter the script that was on the main Pi and then send it to the individuals. Um, so that's kind of an example of what we use this pseudo command playbook for. Um, we also have copy pictures. So I, like I mentioned, um, we, uh, you can run, you can use rsync for these. So here we're pulling uh, the data from the uh, individual pies to the main pie. Um, and so this is the sort of the script needed to pull that data. So um, again, send the command, take the picture, pull the data to the main pie, and then at eve, every evening, pull the data to the Danforth servers is how we're kind of functioning. We also have another uh, file called ping hosts. Um, that's basically, it's just we're pinging those hosts to make sure that, um, to make sure that they're still connected to, uh, connected to the internet and that, you um, know, we can, we can access them through the main pie. And we, we do that ping on a schedule so that if there isn't problem that we hopefully we can fix it um, before we lose a lot of image data. Okay, so like I mentioned, we have a folder on, on the main pie called pie files. Um, these are some of the files that are sent to each of those individual pies. So camera sig uh, single, for example, is the script that's actually used um, in order to collect metadata, um, as well as to um, tr actually trigger the camera with a program called PyCamera. Um, so I'm not, I'm guessing, um, 
uh, Noah and um, Jeff might've used a different um, command to trigger the cameras, uh, Pi cameras, um, when they talked about them um, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we use this Pi camera um, command. It has a bit more control um, and we, we kind of, we like this particular one. Um, so again, you can set um, a lot of the different uh, uh, camera parameters um, within uh, this script. And if you needed to make changes, uh, you would change it here on this main pie and then send it out to all the individual pies. Um, like I mentioned, we also collect metadata. So we want to collect all of the camera settings that are being used um, just in case that ends up being useful. Um, we hardly ever use this information, but if something were to go wrong or we saw strange differences, we would go back to these metadata files to make sure that um, there wasn't anything strange. We also um, make sure we record the IP address um, of the, the Pi as well as the position of that Pi. Um, this allows us to make sure that we can track you know, where that image was actually taken. So we have a metadata file associated with each image file that has is coded with the IP address as well as the position within that chamber so that we have, tr uh, we can track um, the information. Um, so, you know, our images aren't being named image one, two, three, four. We have data about the IP address, the position, all of the camera um, information. Um, another, um, the where it's getting the location information is from this, um, this PI uh, ID text file. So this would obviously be different for each of, uh, for every setup that we have. So um, again, our chambers in this case are named, is named 157. It's the name that our um, growth chamber facilities have named uh, these chambers. And so um, this particular position is uh, 157, uh, shelf one, position one. And we also have maps of these sort, sort of, so that we kind of know physically where those each of these positions are. Um, and in addition to sort of the sort of more human readable um, position name, we also know what that, uh, what IP is associated with that position. So this is sort of how we sort of organize um, our positions. You could add more information um, uh, if necessary, or if wanted. Okay, so what I wanted to do at this point was to actually show you on the command line how um, I would log into a master Pi, manually trigger pictures, and then show you how we also look, just show you examples of how we schedule that with Cron. Um, so I'm gonna switch uh, screens again. Um, and if there's any questions, obviously that I can answer those while I'm switching screens. So far, not so much. Okay. Cool. You can go ahead. Let me switch here. So, okay, I'm on the command line. Um, I'm logged into our network, um, obviously, so that I can log into our pies. So our main pie um, in this case, um, is at this IP address. So if I ls, which means list the files there, um, you'll see there's two folders, one called Guillain Bramble, one called Guillain Bramble Images. Um, when I actually trigger the um, playbook that takes images, the images will go into that image file folder. Um, I'm gonna, sorry, I'm gonna change directories. Uh, to this Guillain Bramble. So if I list that, this should look familiar. This is what basically is in our GitHub. Um, so the host file, the pie files, and the playbooks. And so um, just as a first step, I'm gonna show you how you would manually trigger um, one of those uh, Ansible playbooks. So I'm gonna do the one that we take pictures with. Okay, so just to break down what I just typed, um, the command to trigger a playbook is ansible-playbook. I'm giving it the path to where that um, playbook is. It's at 
um, at, in this playbooks uh, folder and the, the actual playbook is called take picture pictures. Um, I'm gonna wanna run that over the uh, uh, set hosts. So dash I is the option for uh, giving it a file for hosts. And so I'm gonna give it that uh, host.any uh, file. So when I trigger this, it's going to give, it's gonna give us a, some deprecation warnings. Um, obviously we might need to do some updates soon. And then it's gonna actually take pictures um, on, on those Raspberry Pi computers. So right now it's connected to our network. It's connected to a suite of Raspberry Pis. It's taking the pictures over all those Pis with that single command. And it's telling me that all of those Pis were, um, it, it was able to, it was able to um, take pictures across all of those Pis. If there were any problems, say any of those Pis were down or was unable to connect to any of those Pis, some of these would be unreachable or failed. Um, and you would see that um, those problems here. So just to show you, this folder is still empty. So, oops, sorry. This folder is still, oh, it's not empty. Um, I forgot to delete that. Uh, I'll delete that now. Okay, so just to show that that folder is empty, um, I am gonna now pull, do another, run another, run the other playbook that um, moves the pictures from those individual pies to the main pie. So again, I'm going to let me clear this so that I'm. Oops, can't type. I'm gonna clear this. I'm gonna, again, uh, run one of these Ansible playbooks. So the, the script we have to copy those pictures to the main pie is called copy pictures. Again, I'm gonna run it over that set of hosts. And then when I do this again, it's gonna give us the deprecation warning and then it's gonna work on, uh, it's gonna run rsync to uh, move those pictures from those individual puppet pies to the main pie. It's also, it's also tarring the data, it's zipping it up. Uh, I forgot to mention that. So, okay, so now um, if I go to that folder with images, sorry. If I go to that folder with images, ugh, clear. I can't type clear for some reason today. Uh, if I type that, and now we have a folder uh, with a date. And if I go into that folder, um, all those pictures that were on those pies have now been pulled to main. So that's great. I could sit here every hour and individually tr trigger that script, but that's not what we wanna do. We actually wanna run um, some of these commands on a schedule. And so that's where cron comes into play. So I showed you how I manually trigger those files and write out that command, but we can the use cron to run those commands again on the schedule. So if I type cron tab dash, dash E, that's where I get to cron. What's nice again about cron is that it's something that runs in the background. So as long as my Pi has power, it's gonna execute these commands on this schedule, regardless of whether or not I'm logged into the Pi and doing other things. And so I have these commands currently um, currently commented out, but I'm going to turn them back on and sort of walk you through what's kind of going on with each, each of these individual commands. Um, so like I mentioned, um, uh, cron, uh, if, if you see a asterisk, it means do it every time. And if you see specific numbers, it means do it at a certain time. Um, so I'm just gonna use this third line um, as an example, and I apologize because it's wider than the screen um, that I'm showing. 
but this uh, command should look familiar. These two commands should look familiar. This is that take pictures command. Um, so um, this is the, the, ex, um, the command. So it's Ansible playbook. Um, this is the full path to that take pictures command, uh, take pictures playbook. And that dash, dash I, I'm giving it the path to the host name. I'll see if I can scroll over so you can actually see the host. Oops, sorry. Or you can trust me. Um, but that's that's got the host name there. Um, sorry, I'm gonna exit out this. So, sorry. Again, this third line, um, it's doing this, these commands at specific times. So it's saying five minutes um, after each hour. So I say at, at 12.05 or 1.05, um, execute this command and do that between the hours of 8 a.m. and 8 p.m. Every, um, I can't remember what it is, every month or every day of, every, every day of the week, every of, of each year. Um, usually we only mess with these first uh, first two asterisks. Um, so this one's taking a picture is five minutes after the hour and then 30 minutes on after the hour, it's moving those pictures to the main pie from the puppet pies. Um, I'm checking the hosts um, to make, I'm pinging those, those hosts um, 20 minutes after the hour and then 50 minutes after the hour. Um, uh, Sorry, I'm pinging the host 15 minutes after the hour and 45 minutes after the hour, and I'm checking those hosts. So I'm sending the Slack. If there's any Slack errors, it's sending those um, 20 minutes and 15 minutes after the hour. So um, now that these are on, these commands and all of the pies will be triggered automatically um, without me having to, to individually run those playbooks um, uh, every hour or how, however often you want to do it. So now this is on, so I'm just going to exit and it's gonna ask me to save changes and I'm gonna say yes. Um, so it's installing a new cron tab. So now uh, now that this new cron's installed and I've turned off, I've turned actually turned on those commands, it's probably gonna, it's gonna start triggering um, that main pie to do those commands every, um, every hour. Um, you notice, I guess that I've scheduled the cron jobs so they're not um, overlapping. Um, so when you're doing, um, when it's doing, it's executing those playbooks, um, it does say obviously take some time to send the, send and trigger all of those cameras. Um, and so I try not to overlap a lot of commands um, for the sake of not using up a lot of bandwidth on each of those, it, on my main pie. Okay, so I have image data on this main pie, I'm just gonna show you, um, in our case, we have um, we have Condor um, set up, your, your individual servers uh, might be different. Um, in our case, um, we have Condor, and so I'm just gonna show you one of our Condor jobs that we used to pull this image data. It's an rsync job. Um, so let me add up to that. So here I'm running rsync. Um, what's nice about Condor, and I'm sure other systems have this as well, is that they have something called Crondor. So this is like Cron, so I can actually schedule uh, execute this job once and it runs it on a schedule. So um, every, um, at, uh, at 22 hours, so at military time um, 22, it's, um, it's executing this particular uh, Condor job uh, to, to run our sync. And so it's actually pulling data from the main pie um, onto our Danforth servers. So I had the cron turned off right now, but I would turn it back on um, if I was running this on a schedule, but I'm just gonna run this script so I can show you that it's pulling data um, uh, using our sync to our Danforth servers.
So I'm just gonna submit this job. Um, okay, and it runs pretty quickly. So I have a, a, a folder called Phenome Force where that data was supposed to move. Let's just see if it's done. So yep, so this data um, has been moved to our Danforth servers. Um, and so this does this on a schedule. So we'll be pulling this data, individual data to our Danforth server servers uh, nightly. And so that we, um, you know, our Danforth servers are sort of much more reliable. I'm trying not to rely too heavily on that main pi um, for um, main pi. So if something went wrong with that main pi, um, we would sort of, we would get Slack messaging right away. We would know to fix it, um, hopefully. And then we could um, only lose say a day or day or so's worth of data, hopefully if we can get that fixed quickly. Um, so now that that is, I'm gonna switch back to our PowerPoint presentation. That is the sort of logistics um, that we run while using Ansible to manage our suites of Raspberry Pis. It's obviously much easier than SSHing or logging into each of those individual Raspberry Pis that you're controlling. Um, and so we think it's really, uh, we, we found it's a very useful way to manage our suites of Pis. Um, so again, I just wanted to go over some of the challenges and benefits of using Raspberry Pis for um, high throughput imaging and high throughput phenotyping. Um, so a challenge obviously is maintenance and management of these cameras. Ansible makes it easier, but it's still, it's not, um, it's not necessarily a set it and forget it. You need to make sure you check on them. Um, a, a serious benefit though is the increased temporal resolution. So we can get data that looks like this. We can get quantitative data extracted using PlantCV, um, which I'll talk about in a few slides. Um, we can increase the number of, obviously increase the number of plants imaged. Um, but some of the challenges that are involved in this is that you have plants that are overlapping. You have a limited number of views. Um, so obviously if you have growth chambers that um, don't have a lot of headspace, you know, that can really limit the type of plants you can image. Um, you can also, you know, uh, Jose showed you when you're doing, when, at least when we're doing side view imaging, we're only imaging one row of plants, which significantly decreases the number of plants that you can include um, in experiment. Um, and another challenge is that we have uneven, we can't have uneven illumination because the light's warming up or flickering. Um, that can be the case even in high throughput systems or commercial systems um, where you have lighting. Um, uh, but it is a challenge nonetheless. It's obviously less challenging than um, if you're doing phenotyping in a greenhouse, um, but uh, still a challenge even in growth chambers. So I just wanted to briefly go over some, um, uh, a little bit about plant CV, just so that you have some information. And again, um, much more detail and an actual hands-on sort of tutorial on how to uh, use plant CV for some of this Raspberry Pi data is available through another Phenom Forest workshop. So this is that same image data that uh, Jose showed. Um, you'll notice that uh, this image is fairly dark. We found that um, for image analysis, especially for sometimes for color correction, but for image analysis, it often it's often better if um, if it's a darker image rather than an image that's oversaturated. Um, so um, we, uh, we again, we have a top-down images as well as side view images um, that need to be analyzed for a number of different species. Um, and so um, we initially uh, built a software called Plant CV to analyze this high throughput phenotyping data. Um, the goal of Plant CV is to have tools that'll be modular and reusable so that they be combined and recombined with ease to build flexible workflows that will um, extract biologically relevant data. Um, and we wanted these tools to be easily usable by uh, bioinformaticians, data scientists, and biologists. Um, really important for this type of Raspberry Pi data is that this idea about flexible workflows. So if you have a commercial system where 
the images are very regular and um, you can count on the same sort of plant species to be imaged, then your, your workflows potentially could be less flexible because you have very prescribed um, imaging setups, et cetera. With Raspberry Pi imaging, some of you, especially you often need more flexibility um, because you need to add another fill step, add another uh, dilation step um, in order to uh, segment your target object, in this case, often your plant from whatever, whatever background you have. So Plant CV, um, in essence, is a library of modular functions, which you build into workflows. We've changed this, um, this nomenclature. So it, before we called them pipelines, now we call them workflows. Uh, built into Plant CV, then you can take one of those workflows and then parallelize it over a data set. So if you had an a, a individual Pi camera, you might build a workflow for that Pi camera and then parallelize it over the time series um, that's been collected over that image data. And then um, you can uh, you also get out whatever measurement metadata and um, measure extracted measurements that have been extracted from that workflow. Um, important for Raspberry Pi imaging, we tend to try and build information into image names. So um, if you, um, uh, hopefully, um, when you're uh, setting up these systems, you try and um, build some of that metadata into your image names. So by metadata, I could mean, in, in my case, I might mean the IP address or the um, position within the camp within the, the setup. Um, it, got, it could also mean, say, information about the plant that you are um, imaging. So the plant, um, you would obviously want to include date or time information, especially with the time course. Um, and so that uh, metadata could be uh, associated with the um, measurements you're extracting from those images. With Plant CV, we um, um, are building a lot of functionality uh, specifically for plants. There's a lot of functionality that's not necessarily specific for plants. And so for where, where we can, we build off of other um, open source um, computer vision packages like OpenCV and SciPy. And we often, we, we um, use a lot of other, uh, our scikit image. And we also use a lot of other, or integrated with a lot of other open source projects like Jupyter. Um, so that we can um, visualize what's going on in our pipelines when there are, or sorry, our workflows when we're building them. So Plant CV um, is available for download via Condaforge, PyPy, um, and Docker. And we have very extensive documentation, uh, static documentation via read the docs, as well as interactive documentation um, that uses Binder. Um, important for code, testing. Um, so Plant CV is an open source open development project. So that means that we are welcome contributors from um, wherever you are. Um, and because of that, a lot of what um, the Plant CV development team does is build infrastructure in order to make that possible. So we want the community to be able to add functionality. And so that requires infrastructure. Um, so um, for for example, um, we are integrated with a project called CodeCov, which allows us to test our code. So if I build a function that breaks something that Jose's built, um, I can't merge those, cha those, um, those changes into GitHub without resolving, uh, resolving those broken tests. Um, and so that allows us to um, freely sort of uh, take con contributions from all over uh, the world without having to worry about Plant CV being constantly broken by, by contributions from outside contributors or internal contributors. Um, so we're often asked um, how many people use Plant CV. Um, and that's a difficult question to answer, but um, essentially we have approximately 2,500 downloads per month, uh, six unique clones per day. Um, uh, so PyPy downloads also often includes updates. So people actually updating their Plant CV repos. Um, and then important to us is that we have a number of publications. So we have four papers that are on the development of Plant CV. So we're working on the Plant CV3 paper right now. Um, and then we're, we also have um, 26 user papers. So these are people that um, 
aren't necessarily, uh, these aren't papers that are necessarily on the building of plant CV, but are people are uh, using plant CV for their research and science. Um, these are not necessarily people from the Danforth Center, they're people from all over. Um, and we're really proud of the fact that plant CV is being used for science. Um, on the left side of here, you can see an example of Jupyter Notebook. So we don't have a graphical user interface, though we're, we're adding a lot more um, uh, uh, user interactive things through Jupyter, um, which we're really excited about in version four. Um, but we do have a lot of uh, feedback on, on uh, workflow development through Jupyter. So you can actually have each function has a debug image. So you can see um, when you parameterize each of these individual functions, what's being changed. So I wanted to go through a couple of uh, these in these last couple slides, I wanted to go over some uh, challenges that are specific to a lot of Raspberry Pi imaging that we're sort of working on through PlantCV right now. Um, so one open problem is uh, segmentation of individual plants uh, without a lot of training data. So when you're doing Raspberry Pi imaging, one challenge is that um, because we're often imaging plants in flats, um, eventually these plants, depending on their size, touch. Um, so sometimes we're imaging Arabidopsis, what's nice about those is the rosettes, but they do eventually touch. And when they touch, uh, the computer isn't necessarily smart enough to know that these uh, plants are actually uh, different plants and not a single plant or a single object. And so you can, people have done, um, uh, uh, use things like mask RCN, mask RCNN and different convolutional neural networks and deep learning in order to segment individual plants and individual leaf organs. Um, but you might not have the luxury of, of uh, having a lot of um, people to uh, create training data. And so we wanted to try and uh, work on segmentation with all of training data. So this is a function um, that's added to plant CV, um, it's a 3D watershed function that allows us to spatially um, propagate um, labels throughout uh, time um, uh, so that an early, we can take labels from an early time point. So when they're not touching and propagate those to later time points um, and do a 3D watershed segmentation so that we can get um, uh, segment individual plants um, better than say this image here. So you can see there's some uh, pixels here that are misclassified. Some are actually orange when they should probably should be green. Um, but in general, that this function does as pretty good without um, without training. Another um, challenge uh, with uh, not just Raspberry Pi data, but with um, phenotyping data in general, is wanting to be able to. Um, get more information um, from these individual, from, from these, from images. So um, a lot of the information we do is about the sort of gross size and shape of a plant, but we might want to collect more information about individuals. Um, and so this, in this case, you know, this is data collected from Roger Pi. We have this original time course data. Um, we've used MASCAR CNN, so a convolutional neural network approach to sorry, let me trigger this video, to segment those individual leaves. Um, but you'll notice that these individual leaves, the colors kind of bounce around. And that's because leaf one and image one isn't necessarily leaf one and image two. They're not uh, developmentally linked. And so um, a module that uh, Hu Dan Yun in my lab is working on now um, is a time series linking function. Um, so this function allows us to link um, link le uh, segmented leaves um, through time, uh, sort of based on overlap as well as position. Um, so uh, this function that she's uh, working on, she's, she's making it robust to sort of uh, species. So she's working on different methods of um, assigning um, and tr uh, linking leaves through time. So you'll notice in this image now, those colors stay because those leaves have been linked um, and so um, now we can actually get inf information about growth rate of those individual leaves through time. So that is um, basically the end of the presentation we have. I wanted to thank a few specific people. 
Um, so when we were setting up Ansible, we were not starting from scratch. A lot of, um, most of what we do, uh, what we did was based off of a larger setup that Cesar set up through the, for the Mako lab in a, in a greenhouse setup. Um, and we've made some modifications to that to sort of simplify things. Um, we also um, uh, simplify things. And then um, I'll obviously point out um, uh, Haley, who does uh, our main, who is our main plant CV developer. Um, and I show data from Jorge, Hu Dan Yun, um, obviously Jose, who's co-hosting this. Um, and then um, um, I really wanna point out Noah, who um, is my collaborator, is our, you know, who's the, the main driving force between Plant CV um, and who uh, we collaborate with uh, quite a bit um, on the data science end of, end, of, end of what we do. So with that, I'll take any additional questions and I think we can maybe have Jose pop back on um, in case there's any additional questions about setting up these systems. Um, yeah, so thank you for the great workshop. So there have not been so many questions, I guess, because um, there are not so many people working on each Raspberry Pi setups. Um, I have a question, like how long does it take to get um, such great setup working well? Um, because it seems so easy, but um, there are so many Raspberry Pi coordinates. I mean, like, how long does it take if one starts from scratch? Uh, that's a good question. Um, so it, it, it obviously depends on how large of a setup you're doing. So we, we do setups, obviously, in regions where we're typically maybe putting 12 to 24 pies in. Um, so it's just... It's, it depends on the number of pies, how um, often the slowest factor is um, how uh, responsive your IT and facilities um, departments are. We're incredibly lucky at the Danforth Center. Our facilities and IT departments are um, very willing to accommodate us. Um, and that's not always the case um, for many reasons. Um, and so sometimes we're on their schedule. So like if we need static IP addresses, it can take some time. If we need something special cut from by facilities that can add time. Um, I think Jose can maybe speak on actual physical labor in terms of putting things in, but again, it, it depends on how big of a setup you're doing. So we have a walk-in chamber that has, you know, 72 pies set up in there. And that, obviously took a lot of time and effort um, for Jose and Steven and Elizabeth to set up. Um, I, I should obviously uh, call out Elizabeth um, uh, Castillo, who's in the lab. She does a lot of this Raspberry Pi maintenance and she um, has dealt with a lot of the headaches in terms of maintaining these systems. Um, but Jose can talk about that. Yeah, so obviously with experience, it's become faster for us. <laughs> So if we go back to like the very first time we did this, it was also the, ver the very first time, but also the largest one we've done. So it was, I would say about two months to get everything up and running, but we were learning as we were going, we were basically developing. Once we knew it, it takes, I would say about a month like, or less uh, for us to get everything set up, but that's, that's approximate, depends on all the variables that Malia spoke about. <laughs> I'll, I'll also talk about, I just mentioned investment. So we've probably invested about $20,000 into um, all of this physical material that, that obviously doesn't include Jose and Elizabeth's time. Um, uh, but um, in terms of physical materials, it's about $20,000 worth of, of infrastructure that we've added to these growth chambers. I just want to compare that to you know how expensive, at least on our system, it costs to run an experiment. So I think for us, it's about it's between uh, you know three thousand to five thousand dollars per week to run a phenotyping experiment. So and when you compare that to the costs where we've been running these Raspberry Pis sort of continuously for since twenty sixteen now, or earlier than that, um, it's for us, it's worth it. So we're collecting a lot of data at a at fraction of the price that it costs to do a, a phenotyping run. 
and we're collecting data kind of continuously. Yeah, that's great. It gives you a lot more freedom to develop and, you know, create the systems you need, I'm sure. Okay, so if you, is there anything else you wanted to cover before we close up today? Nope, um, if you guys, if there's any questions specifically about doing these setups, like I said, we've obviously made um, a lot of mistakes. Um, and so we've learned a lot along the way. And so if, if, if people have specific questions, they can reach out to us. Perfect. All right, thank you so much for coming on and presenting this workshop today. It was a great opportunity to learn a little bit about big systems and pies, and we certainly are doing it in a big way. And we'll let you go, and I'll just- Thanks. 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 Yeah. Okay. So, I just wanna thank everyone for watching the stream, and next week we will be back with another group workshop. We're changing it up a bit from the Raspberry Pi theme, and we'll be moving on into 3D root reconstruction efforts from the ARPA E project. And that will be with speakers Su Sing Yu and Wesley Vanelli from the University of Georgia. So we will be back at 10 a.m. next Friday for that workshop. So we hope to see lots of you coming back then. If you're not already registered, the registration form is at the bottom and it's in the YouTube video description. So make sure you subscribe to the channel so you get a notification when we go live for that next week. And for the rest of the um, presenters we'll have in the workshop series. So thank you so much everyone for watching and we'll see you next time.